So how much is too much of a good thing? Well, today's artist may epitomize the answer to that question. Uh, this radio titan got off to a strong start in the 70s. Uh, he was pretty much everywhere in the 80s, and then he barely slowed down for the 90s. He took over an established band at the end of the 70s, and then when he got into the 80s, he doubled his output by kicking off an unrelenting solo career at the same time. Beyond that, he also tried his hand at producing, and he collaborated with a lot of different legends. That brings us to today's track, a so-called side project uh, that became a surprise duet when the solo artist he was producing suggested that they write one together. It came on the last day of recording, and it came quickly. They created a rough demo, but then when they came back in the next day to record it, they realized the demo was perfect, so they released it as is. 1985 were the best of times for him, but also a disaster. Find out about this coming up next on Professor of Rock. Hey, music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you begged your parents to take you to a showbiz pizza place as a kid, you're going to dig this channel of deep musical nostalgia. Make sure to subscribe below right now. Click the big red button and click the bell so you always know when our stuff's coming out. Check us out on Patreon as well. That helps us keep it a daily channel. It helps us do all these interviews and keep the content flowing. You can become an honorary producer there and also check us out, uh, our merch, it's right below. So it's time for another edition of one of my favorite shows on here. Number one in our hearts is a show that honors songs that were so great, they should have been number one in the Billboard Hot 100, but for whatever reason, you know, lack of marketing, radio play, label support, or just uh, stupidity, the song came up short. This time around, we're giving you twice as much as usual with a double dose of Phil's. Phil Collins and Philip Bailey, that is. Talking about the global smash hit, Easy Lover. Easy lover get a hold on, you Truly one of the catchiest songs of all time. So to set up uh, a running theme for today's episode, I was kind of thinking about it as I was putting this together. I want to start out by asking a question. Is it possible to have too much of a good thing? And if so, how much Phil Collins is too much Phil Collins. Keep that question in the back of your mind as we go. I love Phil. Uh, but coming into the mid-80s, Phil Collins, he was everywhere. He was also all over the place in the music world. It's five years into the neon decade. The workaholic drummer frontman had already released, let's see, three albums with Genesis, two albums uh, solo, and he headlined the Against All Odds motion picture soundtrack. In the process, he also racked up 11 top 40 hits. That wasn't all Collins was up to. He was also moonlighting for a long list of side projects. For example, 1980, he played drums on former Genesis bandmate Peter Gabriel's third studio album. He also drummed on two Robert Plant records, 1982's Pictures at 11 and 1983's The Principal Moments. There were charity projects like Band-Aids Do They Know It's Christmas in 1984. Later, he became the only artist, as we know, to perform at both Live Aid concerts on two continents on the very same day. So take a look at me now. And that wasn't enough. Phil Collins also took the helm for multiple production projects. He worked with Abba's Frida, produced Eric Clapton's nice studio album, Behind the Sun. <sighs> That's a complicated story for another day, though. I'm trying to be your boy. He also agreed to produce another 80s album for one of his all-time favorite singers, one Philip Bailey. He was taking a break from Earth, Wind & Fire to carve out a solo career. Now, Collins absolutely loved Earth, Wind & Fire, so much so that he even developed a close kinship with EWF's horn section. Don Myrick on saxophone, Louis Louis Satterfield on trombone, and Michael Harris and Romley Michael Davis on trumpet. I collectively known as the Phoenix Horns, and you can catch them uh, on Phil's debut solo album, Face Value. After collaborating on Face Value, the relationship had just stuck. And they chose to join Collins on tour and contributed to some of his other albums as well. 
Philip Bailey, of course, an immensely talented singer. He originally joined Earth, Wind & Fire in 1972 as a co-vocalist and percussionist. He enjoyed a phenomenal run with this group, contributing to 10 studio albums in the process and scoring 30 charting singles, including the number one hit, Shining Star, and top 10 hits, September and Let's Groove. Bailey then released his first solo record, Continuation, in 1983, straight down the middle R&B pop affair. Though it was only a modest success, Philip would then record a gospel album. But it was his next project that would bring him his biggest solo success, talking about 1984's Chinese Wall. When it came time to start on the album, the Phoenix Horns proved to be the perfect connection between the two Phils. As Bailey tells it, he went to see Collins and uh, Genesis play for the first time at the Forum in L.A., uh, this was on their Mama tour, uh, I believe it was January of 1984. Bailey had been invited by his former cohorts, uh, the Phoenix Horns, who are now part of Phil's musical entourage. And Philip Bailey, he was absolutely blown away by the concert. Now, a short time later, while writing and gathering material for Chinese Wall, he told his management that he wanted to cover a Phil Collins song. Unfortunately, that didn't really pan out, but something even better did. Bailey's team reached out to Phil Collins and discovered that he was a huge Earth, Wind & Fire fan. Now, one thing led to another, and before you knew it, Collins had agreed to produce Philip Bailey's album, though I don't know how he had the time. He said Bailey about it, Working with Phil was the best. We were the same age, and he has an easygoing personality and is unassuming and not egotistical in any way. For him, it was all about the music, and he wasn't caught up in the star thing that was exploding around him. We would just show up at the studio and roll tape. In early summer 1984, Philip Bailey flew from L.A. to London to meet up with Collins and to get the project started. Uh, the two teamed up at Townhouse Studios in London. I think uh, Phil Collins spent something like three or four months working on Chinese Wall with Bailey. Now, besides producing the disc, Collins also played drums and percussion on the entire album. Uh, he also contributed keyboards and backing vocals on a lot of the songs as well. But there was one more key musical actor who would leave a lasting mark on this album. Talking about bass guitarist extraordinaire Nathan East. Nathan was a good friend of Bailey's and had played on his previous album, Continuation. At Bailey's invitation, East flew into London for the final two weeks of recording. Said Nathan about the experience. It was fun because we had two weeks of getting to make music together and the bass player drummer love affair was being set up. So it was really great. I enjoyed playing with Phil Collins from the first note. Nine songs were already written and demoed the day that he arrived. The album was pretty much done. However, the most famous track from the album, Easy Lover, was yet to be written. According to Nathan East, they didn't pull Easy Lover out of the ether until the end of uh, his second week at Townhouse Studios. Not only was it the last song written for the album, it happened completely last minute. It was finalized on the very last day. With everything else on Chinese Wall pretty much in place, Philip Bailey realized it just wasn't a standout single yet. Kind of so he was thinking out loud, and Bailey actually said, man, we still don't have that undeniable single that the record label would instantly pick, and that's what we need. And then he turned to Phil Collins and he said, and I quote, we haven't written anything together on this album. Challenge accepted. Bailey started singing a bass line. Phil got on the drum kit and Nathan East sat down at the piano and he started playing a riff. Now as East remembered it, it was playing the main riff on the piano and Philip Bailey, he started singing the verse. And we're just fooling around with some chords and Phil Collins starts chiming in with these melodies. Then Philip started singing something about a choosy lover, you know, over the top of the piano chords. Wait, choosy lover? So it turns out that was just the working title for the song. It's what they sang in the beginning. It wouldn't last, though. Find out how we got to the next bar. So we break this down. I do want to thank our sponsor, Zenny. I wear the glasses I always wear. You know, Zenny has deals going all the time at their site. Click on our info button 
You can check those deals out all the time. Remember, they have a 30-day peace of mind guarantee. Design your own pair at Zenny right here at our info button. So after a day's work of hammering away at the song, the trio recorded a rough but energetic instrumental take before calling it a day. Uh, that night, Phil finalized the lyrics when he was at home, but he changed Choosy Lover to Easy Lover. She's an easy lover. The adjective switch was a huge improvement. It gave the song a completely different vibe. It just rolled off the tongue. It was a vibe that, I might add, fell into Colin's wheelhouse. Phil's easy lover is the kind of girl you dream of, dream of keeping hold of. But in the end, she's going to play you, she's going to leave you. Of course, Phil's advice in the song is, you better forget it or you're going to regret it. And of course, we've covered Phil many times on here, and this all sounds very familiar. Uh, Easy Lover, it's another allusion to Phil's first wife, Andrea Bertarelli. That's what he said. Uh, of course, we've covered that ill-fated relationship uh, just even a few months ago. To say it didn't end happily, for those of you that don't know, the two divorced in 1980 and Andrew would inspire a wellspring of mainstream hits for Phil, uh, from In the Air Tonight to Against All Odds, Take a Look at Me Now and Do Invisible Touch. He couldn't stop writing about Andrea. So with lyrics like, she'll take your heart, but you won't feel it, Easy Lover seemed to fit that mold. Anyway, the next morning, the three musicians regrouped at the studio to finish this song. But you know what? When they listened to the instrumental demo, they realized there was nothing wrong with it. It was perfect. It was exactly what they needed. They agreed to keep it exactly the way it was. That's what you hear. You hear the demo. That's what was released. So as Philip Bailey was starting to go into the vocal booth alone to record the song, Nathan suggested that they should make the song a duet. Just two Phils singing about this easy lover. And of course, it was a genius idea. The song was released in November of 1984. And as you know, Easy Lover was a monster hit and a crossover smash. It debuted on the Hot 100 at number 63 in November of uh, 84. 10 weeks later, it climbed to number two. It's only kept out of the top spot by Foreigner's uh, I Wanna Know What Love Is, which when you get behind a song like that, it's tough. Easy Lover, it also reached number 15 on the AC charts. Went to number seven on the U.S. Dance Club chart, number five on the Top Rock Tracks chart, and number three on the Hot Black Singles chart. It also went to number one on the Cashbox Top 100. That's a really rare feat to succeed on so many different genre charts. Really impressive, actually. Probably the biggest crossover hit of the entire 80s. It was a smash hit across the globe. It went to number 10 in Sweden, number eight in Switzerland, six in South Africa, number five in Finland and Germany, number four in Belgium, number two in New Zealand, and it went to number one in Canada, Ireland, and the U.K., where it actually stayed on top for four weeks. I mean, overall, Easy Lover, it was one of the biggest records of 1985, not just here, but everywhere. It really launched Philip Bailey to a whole new musical plateau. The music video for Easy Lover also helped the song's success. It was created in a documentary style. Uh, the music clip features multiple behind the scenes looks at making the video. That starts out with Bailey and Collins being interviewed, putting it all together. Collins says, it's kind of interesting because we're doing a video of making a video of making a video. There's lots of things going on at the same time. It's not like uh, your normal kind of promo clip. You know, there's lots of things going on at the same time. It's not like a, the normal kind of promo clip. It was a huge hit all over MTV. It helped uh, the song to, you know, rise in the charts. In the music video, you can catch the two Phils not only practicing the song, but rehearsing their choreography, picking out their costumes, even arriving at the shoot in a helicopter. Uh, you just come away from it feeling like these two guys are the best of friends and the whole time, you know, smiles on their faces, just messed around, having a lot of fun. The playful video won some big accolades, actually. It scored an MTV Video Music Award for Best Overall Performance in a Video. Uh, that was in 85. As far as pop culture placements go, Surprisingly, there haven't been a lot. 
terms of media, Easy Lover has appeared in American Crime Story, Sink or Swim, and Ted Lasso. That's a big one there. It's also been covered by Eric Clapton, Taylor Hawkins and the Coattail Riders, and also Earth, Wind & Fire has done it. 1985, it was just a massive year for Phil Collins. It was a year of Phil Collins. Uh, besides scoring a number two ranking with Easy Lover, Phil would also reach number one three times. Separate Lives, another duet from the White Knight soundtrack. There's also Susudio and One More Night from No Jacket Required, which incidentally also went to number one on the Billboard 200. Uh, the album was massive. He was on top of the world. Everything went according to plan in Phil Collins' peak year of 1985. Uh, let's go back. Remember how he mentioned Collins performed at Live Aid? Turns out playing both sides of the Atlantic may have had Collins biting off a little bit more than he could chew. At Live Aid Philadelphia, in addition to performing his own songs, he teamed up with the remaining members of Led Zeppelin, the Lords of Rock, Robert Plant, Jimmy Page, and John Paul Jones. Uh, he took his place at one of two drum kits. He and drummer Tony Thompson tried to keep the beat for a trifecta of Zeppelin classics. as rock and roll, a whole lot of love, and Stairway to Heaven. This performance would definitely go down in history, but for all the wrong reasons. Uh, the set, according to Phil Collins, was pretty bad. Plant's voice was hoarse. Uh, Jimmy Page's Les Paul was out of tune, and neither drummer could get in sync with one another. Collins, in his biography, goes into great detail why none of this was his fault. He ultimately said, If it could have walked off, I would have. But then we'd all be talking about why Phil Collins walked off Live Aid. So I just stuck it out. Uh, you know, technical difficulties, lack of rehearsal time, and Plant's voice being out of shape really were the main culprits of a live performance that has been called a unmitigated disaster. So horrible, the band actually blocked the broadcast of their sets and banned it from being on the Live Aid DVD that uh, was released a few years back. Jimmy Page said, and I quote, Robert told me Phil Collins wanted to play with us. I told him that was all right if he knows the numbers. But at the end of the day, he didn't know anything. We played a whole lot of love and he was just there bashing away cluelessly and grinning. I thought that was really a joke. It's a crazy story, really. Um, you got so many different uh, points of view there. Let me know in the comments if you want, like to get the full story of this one. It's actually very interesting. We could do a full piece on it. <music> to this day, Easy Lover remains an essential pop radio throwback of the 80s, garnering more than 460 million streams on Spotify and YouTube alone. It's lived a long, healthy life in the set lists of both Bailey and Collins, appearing on a number of greatest hits collections and live albums. Now, unfortunately for Philip Bailey, such a great vocalist, Easy Lover would be his only solo Hot 100 hit. But it was a big one. As for Phil Collins, he would continue his rampage across the charts in the 80s going into the 90s. Which brings me back to the initial question, how much Phil Collins is too much Phil Collins? You gotta wonder, did side projects like this one oversaturate the market? Or was he so good it just didn't matter? Let me throw out a few more numbers and then you can decide for yourself. We'll have a great discussion below about it. So from May 1980's Misunderstanding to April 1987's Into Deep, Phil Collins drops something like 30 singles. That's 30 singles in just a seven year span. That of course includes solo single soundtrack hits and uh, collaborations like Easy Lover and Genesis singles as well. If you do the math, that means Phil Collins averaged a new single once every three months for seven straight years. Actually a little under that. I think every 84 days we were hearing a new Collins uh, song of some sort on the airwaves. <laughs> From 88 to 99, Collins began to slow his pace. He released uh, 27 singles over those next 11 years, which is still a ridiculous number. 
that averages out to two or three Phil Collins singles a year. And if you put those two decades together, 57 singles. Phil had created a sonic empire. So with all that in mind, did projects like Easy Lover help Phil Collins cause or hurt it? Was it too much Phil? You know what? Even with so much rampant exposure on the airwaves, you have to admit that Easy Lover ranks up there with the best of Collins' offerings. This song, written on the fly, definitely belongs near the top at number one, really. So we're giving it number one in our hearts, honors. And you know what? I loved all of his stuff. I think he's a phenomenal singer. One of the most underrated singers, underappreciated singers ever. Nobody sings like Phil Collins. So much passion, so much heart-wrenching heartache in those, those songs that he wrote. You can talk about Michael Jackson and George Michael and Madonna and Bruce Springsteen and all the great hit makers of the 80s, but Phil Collins in the 80s, the man was an institution. Hey, thanks so much for watching. Leave us a comment about Phil Collins and Philip Bailey in Easy Lever, one of the best duets of the 80s. What are your memories of the song? What do you think about Phil Collins? The guy who had a hit song every couple months in the 80s. It's just unbelievable. Uh, let's have a, a discussion below. What are some of your favorite songs and albums? Uh, who was the best of the 80s? Who do you think was the best hit maker of the 80s? Let's have a talk about that below. If you like our content, we do invite you to subscribe. We would love to have you as part of our, part of our community. Until next time, three chords and the truth, my friends.